Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to so many of you for staying throughout the day and into and through uh, this last panel on our session on ethics and globalization. Uh, this panel will no doubt uh, recapitulate some of the points made in the earlier panel, but with a particular angle of, uh, an, a, in some ways, a, an off-putting word, governance but, uh, uh, and sovereignty. But I think it gets to some of the um, uh, issues that we were raising uh, throughout the day about solidarity, loyalty, cosmopolitanism. There, you, you, We've heard those terms. Uh, used throughout the day, and they really have to do with what loyalty and obligations do we have to what level of governance and authority that are in control in our society, and are we citizens of the world, or are we citizens of nations, and what do we owe to each other? And in particular, what we, I thought it was very interesting, um, Barney Frank's presentation when he was talking about the difficulties of sustaining support for international governance institutions, in particular the big three, the IMF, the World Bank, and the WTO. It was interesting, I'm sure it was interesting to you as well, that he said, well, we on the left uh, 20 years ago had enormous skepticism, perhaps even hostility, you know, going back to the uh, late 90s, the East Asian crisis, the, uh, you know, the battle in Seattle, but he said, oh, well, they've reformed uh, a lot since then, uh, and now we on the left uh, are more comfortable with these institutions. Uh, but lo and behold, it's the uh, conservatives who are uh, most critical now. Um, I do think that we come, we, we're, our discussions have to, on a practical level, deal with these institutions because they are the increasingly important authorities over the world economy. And so today we're, we meet at a time where I think it is still fair to say, despite what Barney Frank said, that there's widespread skepticism about the legitimacy, the accountability, and the efficiency of these important institutions. So we're gonna have some debate about that. We're gonna also talk about whether or not in uh, terms of uh, increasing globalization, whether there is a pause uh, in the global economic integration. A couple of the panelists have observed already, uh, I think trenchantly, that um, if not a deglobalization is going on, there is a pause. People are nervous about growing economic integration. So they're nervous about the legitimacy of these institutions. They're nervous about the process itself that they reflect. So we have a great panel to discuss that and uh, will culminate with words uh, from Mike Froman, who is the practitioner and who will bring us back down to earth uh, after the three of us, after the first three panelists talk about what should be and what ought to be. So I, it's a pleasure to start with uh, Andy Moravchik, who is now Professor of Politics and Director of the European Union Program at Princeton's Woodrow Wilson School. I'm not gonna rehearse all of the bios, you have them. Andy's gonna have to leave a little bit early because he's really singing for his supper today uh, at another place. Uh, we'll start with Andy to talk about uh, the issue of the legitimacy and accountability of the institutions and to describe his view, which I think can be summarized, that they're more accountable, democratic, and legitimate than is often perceived. Take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. I, if, um, if Mike's going to bring us back to Earth, I've got to get us out to Pluto as quickly as possible, so I'm going to get going here. Um, so uh, I, I think it's right that there is a real concern about global governance being democratically illegitimate. And uh, big words, but the bottom line is that people feel like they're giving up something precious in domestic life when they commit 
to global governance institutions because it degrades their autonomy to govern themselves in local societies. And some people think this trade-off is worth it, that we get um, you know, more economic efficiency and things like that for it. Other people think it's not worth it, but almost everybody agrees that this kind of a trade-off exists um, because global decision-making seems to be, by its very nature, distant and diffuse out of the control of individuals and individual nation states. Um, and as Steve suggested, I want to suggest that that's not as true as it seems to be, and that if we think about it more carefully, we can find ways to be critical of the places where it is true, but also recognize the ways in which global governance actually can not only maintain democracy the way we practice it at home, but enhance it um, by delegating to international institutions. And the starting point is to think about joining an international institution or committing to global governance, very much like the way we commit to constitutional principles at home. Uh, we believe, and all modern democracies believe, that committing to constitutions enhances democracy um, in various ways. Most modern democracies are not, all modern democracies are not plebiscitary or populist, they're constitutional democracies because they provide certain things in democratic life that are not possible if you simply seek to maximize participation. Um, and we seek to provide these things by pre-committing to a set of norms that permit us to achieve certain things. So the question we should ask about global governance, that's the questions we should ask, are the same questions we ask about our own constitution. Why do we accept it? What do we look for in it? What constitutes a democratically legitimate constitution? And when does a constitution become a problem? And I want to focus on just two broad ways in which a constitutional commitment or a global governance commitment may be thought of as enhancing democracy or increasing our ability to engage in meaningful self-rule or accountability or control over our own lives. The first has been discussed more, and so I'll only mention it briefly. But that is that engaging in global governance, engaging through global governance in globalization, like committing to a constitution, expands the set of possible policy outcomes. This seems on the surface purely pragmatic, right? You can get economic welfare or control certain regulatory outcomes, fight disease, whatever it is, uh, by, by joining international organizations. But we can also think about this democratically. Um, it's not just an increase in effectiveness for which you surrender some sort of democratic control to some gnomes there in Brussels or Geneva or some other place. Um, among the collective rights of a people is always, their democratic rights, is always the right to contract multilaterally and to expand the scope of the group. This was the decision that our own founding fathers faced when we created our own constitution amongst the states of the United States to secure certain advantages. And in doing so, what you do is you engage in a reciprocal transaction. You give up some discretion over domestic laws in exchange for other people, in the case of global governance, other people in other countries, giving up discretion over decisions that affect you. And the result is a net increase in democratic control over your own life. Otherwise, presumptively, and this may not always be the case, but we should assume since most international organizations are unanimously agreed to, a, the result is a net gain in democratic control. Otherwise, countries wouldn't agree to it in the first place. Trade is the obvious example where we give up control over protection of import competing industries in order to gain advantages um, both lower prices for goods, but more importantly, um, access for exporters uh, by controlling the laws of foreign countries that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. As Barney Frank pointed out, you can expand this to other kinds um, of advantages, including the expansion of democracy itself. So international institutions have become one of the great carriers uh, of democracy promotion and empowering people in foreign countries and even in the United States formally and informally to consider options for democratic participation that they didn't have um, before. This isn't just formal democracy promotion, but even 
expanding the range, for example, of judicial norms that a court might consider in the United States. But the second desirable quality of constitutions and of global governance, and the second way in which it might be thought of as enhancing democracy, is that it achieves other necessary democratic goals other than pure responsiveness to immediate popular will. So in designing a democratic polity, we don't simply seek to maximize participation or responsiveness to popular will. We don't just follow majority opinion as reflected in referenda or in elections or even in uh, legislatures or polling. Instead, we believe it would be both imprudent and unethical to do this. And we believe that's true for a number of universal reasons that most modern societies agree to. And these three reasons constitute important ways in which global governance can strengthen our own democracy and that of other countries. The first is the guarantee of human and minority rights, the assurance of a minimum standard of equal treatment for individuals and groups beneath which we will not go. Constitutions make such rights majority proof, and international institutions are actually quite good at backstopping domestic efforts to promote human rights, including the right to domestic governance. And it's not by chance that this is one of the things international institutions have specialized in. Um, you may read a lot about people in the UK being upset uh, at regulation by the EU regulators or by European human rights institutions of how they handle immigrants or they, how they handle certain uh, disputes, but that's because in all modern societies, such disputes are handled by non-democratic means. The second um, uh, goal is to combat powerful special interests that tend to capture open participatory processes. Uh, the framers of the US Constitution called these special interests factions, and they thought the advantage of the larger US jurisdiction was it helped you overcome special interests. The obvious uh, parallel in global governance is to trade, um, where we seek to create a larger realm in which we can overcome protectionist interests, um, in part by insulating decision makers from them, and in part by create, crafting a deal which is larger than just the interests of a single member state. And third, uh, constitutions and global governance seek to promote more informed, competent, and deliberative decision making. We don't believe uh, that all people in localities necessarily care or know or are expert or informed enough about all decisions to be able to be able to make them competently. And by expanding the jurisdiction or expanding the players, uh, we can make them better. This is an argument that I think uh, my colleague Chuck Sable made quite brilliantly in the, pa in the, re in the previous panel um, as regards the way that the European Union makes uh, regulation. Now this seems very abstract, but I'd like to close by just suggesting a number of ways in which it helps us to talk about policy issues in a critical way, that is in a way that distinguishes good from bad multilateralism, uh, drawing on uh, the discussion earlier today. One good rule of thumb which would come out of this is that we should consider uh, international institutions to be presumptively democratic if and only if they pr preserve at least as much direct popular control as functionally similar dom domestic institutions do, unless there are offsetting gains in terms of human rights, combating special interests, or more competent and informed decision making. Most international institutions are surprisingly open to a welter of different influences. I think the WTO uh, is a good example. They tend to be consensual, super majoritarian, uh, full of different nooks and crannies. It takes forever for them to make decisions. In my academic life, I'm a student of the European Union, which just has too many people involved in every decision all the time. Um, where such institutions in trade are not uh, open to social forces or where they are deliberately insulated, such as in fast-track negotiation in the United States, it is often with the deliberate intent of freezing out special interests uh, that would block it. Um, this implies, um, however, that we can be critical about institutions uh, 
uh, that have the opposite effect. Contrast this with the Euro uh, institutions in Europe. The European Central Bank is more independent than any existing domestic central bank in Europe or elsewhere with no obvious democratic or technocratic justification. Why? Right? So that would be a case where, uh, and one sees the effect. We see that the commitment is, as it stands, unsustainable in half of Europe. Um, so that suggests that, in fact, when international institutions are, do not meet the criterion uh, of, of being as democratic as what they replace, they tend not only to be questionable from a democratic legitimacy standpoint, um, but uh, unworkable as well. Second and final um, uh, practical um, suggestion would be that global governance would be presumptively democratic if and only if it incorporates standards that seek to strike an explicit balance between universal and local goals. Um, and it is surprising the extent to which we have seen today, I think, that international institutions, global governance institutions, actually do this. You'll notice how the discussion started off this morning, those of you who are here, uh, with a kind of stylized discussion of uh, international institutions as seeking global goals uh, and member, uh, nation states as opposing them. But increasingly we saw, starting with Barney Frank, I think, that the international institutions themselves are reforming themselves to take into account to a greater and greater extent over time specific varied national differences. A great example um, is the WTO, which increasingly is focused precisely on drawing a balance between the uh, goal of free trade and the legitimate regulatory exceptions to it within the organization, not just as a political compromise between the organization and member states. Again, a contrast to this would be the Eurozone, where the institution was constructed without such an explicit compromise within it and is only now struggling in a very brittle way to try to achieve it. Those are only two of, I think, a lot of different ways in which viewing global governance institutions as constitutional compromises, very much like the ones we make at home and view as democratically legitimate as home, at home, helps us understand uh, what we've heard earlier today and when we should view it as something that is comfortingly democratically legitimate or the proper object of criticism. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Professor Danny Roderick of, uh, of Harvard, uh, I think Adam uh, Posen mentioned this morning that uh, the book the Peterson Institute uh, published uh, of, of his Has Globalization Gone Too Far is uh, I think the all-time or one of the all-time bestsellers here. Uh, very few people have been tougher, more thoughtful, in a sympathetic way to globalization uh, in discerning its limits and problems. Uh, Danny, uh, I've heard it joked that um, cosmopolitans are from Venus and nationalists are from uh, Mars. Uh, Andy said he was from Pluto. Where are you from? And are, do you have the view of global institutions that we've just heard outlined by Andy. Um, somewhere, um, I'll, I'll figure out where I am by the end of my comments. But let me let me let me say um, that that I actually agree very much with um, Andy's presentation. In fact, um, uh, Andy has a has a piece with um, uh, um, Bob Cohen and and, uh, uh, and Steve Macedo called uh, Dem democracy enhancing multilateralism and and um, uh, this is this is one of the most insightful pieces I, I've read on this question and and much of which uh, what uh, Andy talked about uh, summarized the the argument in that piece um, I will uh, I will build on on what uh, Andy said and I think in fact our conclusions are fairly parallel and I think it'll be useful for a, 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 a what I assume is mostly an, ec an economics-oriented group to actually make a distinction between uh, democracy-enhancing global governance uh, versus an economic globalization-enhancing global governance. And I think 
once we see that distinction, um, uh, some of the issues that you were mentioning at the end, Andy comes out, and I think see where, where uh, some of the slippage um, uh, um, is becoming problematic. Uh, a, a, a quick preliminary first, and I think it's just helpful to see that uh, when we're talking about what democratic governments do, um, uh, if we're going to say that whatever a democratic government chooses to do by way of entering into an international agreement is democratic by virtue of the fact that the democratic government has chosen to do it, um, then you know, we might as well stop talking um, because that's just the nature of the beast. Um, so uh, what democratic governments choose to do cannot be simply justified by the fact that they've chosen to do it. That doesn't necessarily make it prima facie um, uh, 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 democratic in a deeper sense of democracy, in the sense of sort of you know, um, thinking about the quality of democracy. So just, just to be clear as a preliminary that we're really, when we're talking about the nature of democratic governance, uh, we're talking about the quality of that democratic governance, and sometimes democratic governments do things that uh, internally as well as interna internationally can be more or less democratic. And I think we need to understand um, uh, um, uh, the global governance in that, in that same context. Now, I want to make um, three quick points. Um, uh, um, the, f the first point um, is that most of our global economic problems uh, actually require better domestic governance, not better global governance. So most of our failures are on account of domestic governance, not on account of global governance. Second, um, I want to argue um, uh, that there is only partial overlap uh, between the type of global rules or global governance that would enhance economic globalization versus those that would uh, enhance uh, national governance or national democratic governance. So this is the point about the distinction between democracy enhancing uh, global governance versus globalization enhancing global governance. And finally, that um, a set of global rules or global governance arrangements that would enhance, that are specifically targeted on enhancing democratic governance uh, as opposed to simply enhancing uh, economic globalization, uh, are as likely to expand uh, domestic policy space as to narrow it. Um, so that when we look at what needs to be done globally from the perspective of enhancing governance, uh, we're no longer looking at purely restricting the space through common rules and harmonization. We're actually um, uh, uh, potentially looking also at ways of empowering uh, dem 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 democratic governments uh, to do the job that, that they have to do. Uh, so that's, that's the skeleton of, of, of my argument. So I just want to just uh, very quickly uh, pick out some of these issues. First, I said that uh, most of our global economic problems uh, require better national governance, not greater global governance. Um, so we've run th ran through some of the sort of the, the big issues here, things like excessive trade protectionism, uh, uh, agricultural subsidies, uh, global financial crises, um, uh, you know, immigration restrictions, uh, um, uneven patterns of economic development in the world. Each one of these things, in each one of these areas where failure occurs, it occurs primarily as a result of domestic policy failures, not lack of adequate international cooperation or the absence of appropriate global rules. Um, I think it's a very, um, we tend to think about the world economy as a sort of a, a global public good and too often make an analogy with something like climate change and with the argument that, that if not everybody does, you know, so what's good for the world as a whole, then we're all collectively uh, going to suffer. The world economy is not like that, because in all of these areas I just um, uh, uh, um, checked, uh, what is good globally is actually good nationally. That is that when we make the argument for free trade, we do not make it on the basis that countries ought to pursue free trade policies because it's good for the rest of the world. We say it's good for each country for its own national interest to pursue those. When we say in a case of agricultural subsidies that they're outrageous, uh, most of the cost of agricultural subsidies that disproportionately are borne by domestic consumers and taxpayers, not the rest of the world. Um, if we've had a succession of global financial crises, it's not because countries have wanted to export their financial problems 
Um, uh, it's because they have not pursued adequate models of financial regulation domestically, and therefore they have borne the cost of those crises first and foremost at home. Uh, with respect to even immigration restrictions, of course, that would have big effects on the rest of the world as well. Uh, but again, the basic economic logic is that relaxing immigration restrictions or re re relaxing rules on labor flows are good for each country in and of itself in terms of its own economic logic. So if we are not making advance on these things, the first order um, uh, culprit uh, isn't really because we don't have the appropriate global rules, it's because we are either from a strictly economic perspective uh, not doing the right thing at home, or there are alternative non-economic objective, other things that are entering into the democ democ democratic or other governance mechanisms at home uh, that suggest that we're reaching other kinds of, of, uh, of, of um, of, of, of solutions. Now, of course, there are exceptions. For example, in trade, the clear exemption of, of using trade policy for terms of trade uh, purposes, where uh, you're using trade to extract uh, terms of trade, monopoly rights, monopoly rents from other countries. That's precisely the kind of reason where you have a rationale for something like a GATT system or a WTO system, because you're using a policy that's explicitly better thy neighbor. Uh, but in fact, uh, most of these kinds of, including trade policy, I think you'd be hard pushed uh, to make the case that today trade policy is being driven by terms of trade reasons uh, as opposed to uh, um, uh, much more um, um, uh, other uh, sort of domestic goals. So that's really the, 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 the first problem, that, that the first issue is that if we, the, the first order cul culprit here is really um, uh, um, uh, uh, from, if we're looking at it from an economic perspective, our failures domestically, to the extent that there are in fact failures, we don't know because the, like, the broader political calculus might suggest that some of these policies might be desirable domestically. Let me come to my second uh, point, which is that there is only partial overlap between global rules that would enhance globalization and those that would enhance national governance. Uh, so again, here, the distinction is between um, what um, Andy and his co-authors call democracy-enhancing multilateralism, or what we might call in this context democracy-enhancing global governance, and globalization-enhancing uh, um, uh, global governance. So think for a second about what um, um, hyper-globalization would require. I think Arvind mentioned the notion of hyper-globalization. Think about a, a world of hyper-globalization where, in fact, we've eliminated practically um, all or, or nearly all transactions costs associated with national borders. What does that require for the conduct of domestic policy? What kind of restrictions would that actually require? Well, full globalization in that sense, in that sense of hyper-globalization, would, of course, require governments to forswear the imposition of any, ta any transactions costs at the border. They would require them uh, to uh, fully harmonize their, their, their regulations uh, with those of other countries so that these jurisdictional discontinuities do not exert uh, additional transactions costs. And finally, it would actually require governments to irrevocably commit not to deviate from only of those rules because uh, any uh, lack of irrevocable commitment would create uncertainty and therefore transactions costs that block trade. Uh, now, uh, the, qu the question is to what extent, uh, in fact, um, a hyper-globalization of that kind is compatible uh, with democ democratic governance, and my argument would be that, in fact, it wouldn't be, uh, given the extreme narrowness of uh, the democratic decision space uh, that that model of hyper-globalization would require. Now, it is absolutely right, as Andy st stressed, uh, that democracies delegate. They undertake commitments. Uh, but not all delegations are democratic. Uh, and that's uh, in the domestic sphere. Uh, we know that delegation occurs under very limited conditions um, and that often the chain of delegation can get too long uh, to create democratically unhealthy results, just like in the previous panel we were talking about uh, the supply chain getting too long uh, can endanger the health of, um, the, um, of, 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 of health workers and products. Uh, I think there's a, the, the chain of democratic delegation can, take too long, can, can be too extended as well. Let me contrast, for analytical purposes, two kinds of commitments uh, or delegation, one of which is unambiguously good from a democratic standpoint, and the other is not so. Um, 
the standard form of democratic delegation that is good is when you delegate to avert a time consistency problem. Uh, in other words, uh, think about two political parties. Both of them suffer from high inflation, and uh, they would rather commit to an independent central bank um, and uh, delegate power to an autonomous body to, um, to set monetary policy. Both of them end up being better off. Uh, the democratically elected executive is, is reducing his or her uh, ability to act, but as Andy said, the quality of democratic performance is improving as a result of that commitment. Uh, but here is another model of commitment where, in fact, one party in power commits uh, to a set of global rules uh, so as to as effectively disempower the party that is not in power. Uh, that is, in other words, it's using commitment as a way of redistribution. Um, and, uh, and this does not actually have the kinds of, 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 of democratic qualities uh, that the first kind of, of commitment has. So if you are undertaking commitments, whether domestic or international, to counteract time inconsistency, um, that's one thing. If you're undertaking them to uh, cement redistributive policies, um, I think uh, that's uh, another thing altogether. And from a democratic, uh, um, uh, from the quality of democratic governance perspective, that, at least to me, looks much less acceptable. Um, in fact, we have a, a lot of examples um, um, that, that uh, Andy mentioned um, how um, through delegation, we can, in principle, offset factions. We can protect minority rights. We, we can enhance quality of democratic deliberation. Of course, we can find in each one of these instances are, you know, examples that go exactly the opposite way as well. Uh, the, the, the TRIPS example has been mentioned uh, often, where, in fact, an international agreement has been used uh, to, to essentially to empower a faction rather than restrict a faction. Um, uh, we can talk about the uh, inadequacy of Basel standards, for example, how the, the, um, the, the Basel standards have been essentially captured by uh, financial interests, not necessarily in a way that would uh, restrain a faction, but, but, but empower it, um, and, and so on. So let me get um, to, the, to my final uh, point. Um, having said that uh, democracy enhancing globalization and global and, uh, democracy enhancing global governance and uh, economic globalization enhancing global governance aren't the same, uh, my final point is that a set of global rules or a set of you know a global governance architecture uh, that asks the question not how do we maximize economic globalization, but actually how we do we enhance the performance of governance, whether democratic or not. Uh, that such an ar architecture uh, is as likely to expand domestic policy space for governments um, as to narrow it. Why do we need the, nar the, the expansion of policy space? Well, there are, um, uh, uh, we need it because democratic governance have important functions. Uh, Barney Frank talked about them. Uh, it, it came out in a lot of the, the earlier panels. Um, uh, I think rich countries, the main challenge, I think, advanced countries is to recreate the kind of social bargains um, uh, that, that have been fraying. Um, and that's going to require the provision of social insurance. Uh, it's going to require a combination of tax policies and labor rules, uh, which require uh, somewhat greater policy maneuver uh, than what hyperglobalization uh, either presently or, or going forward would, uh, would, would, um, would, would impose. Developing countries uh, require an ability to restructure their economies in order to grow and, in fact, leverage their economies to take advantage of economic globalization, uh, call it industrial policy or whatever. Clearly, the kinds of policies that East Asian countries and China have used uh, to such uh, good effect. Once again, a narrowing of the policy space uh, would, would preclude many of the kinds of policies that East Asian countries and, and China have used to, to very good effect. Governance enhancing multilaterals would do what its name says, which is the improve the capacity of national democracies to generate the policy outcomes that are consistent with the preferences of the citizenry. Um, and here, I would say that, uh, that there are differences between different types of rules, that restrictions that are based on the pure harmonization of policy outcomes are much more problematic and would need to pass much higher threshold in, some, in terms of the overall efficiency gains provided compared to global norms or global restrictions that operate at the level of procedural norms. 
So I would say that international agreements that emphasize universalizable democratic norms, uh, such as transparency, accountability, representativeness, evidence-based decision-making, uh, these are okay uh, because they are universalizable norms, uh, but they do not require each individual country necessarily to arrive at the same policy conclusions at the same regulatory structures. Um, and I think a, 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 we, when we, if we start looking at mechanisms of global governance from the perspective of enhancing uh, ability of governments to do what they need to do, uh, then we're going to be focusing much more on, on, on these universalizable, universalizable norms of democratic governance, much less on, on working on getting a common system of financial regulations or, uh, or, 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 or reaching deeper into the uh, uh, industrial and regulatory structures of different countries. So let me just stop here. Howard, we just heard uh, Danny say that the um, failures that have been elucidated so far today uh, have been failures of domestic governance more than international governance, and that, uh, if anything, domestic govern uh, governing uh, authorities need more space to address some of these issues, if I haven't tortured your uh, thoughtful uh, presentation too much with that oversimplification. Howard, do you agree? So uh, thank you very much, Steve, and um, thank you to also to all the others on the panel. I think um, I, I do want to pick up from where Donnie uh, s spoke about the need for the, the, the fact that a lot of the problem is the failure of the, the, at the local level, the national level. The question I've always asked myself is, you know, how do we go about it? How do we solve it? And I'm going to suggest that uh, we need more action at the national level that is going to be done through an international commitment. And I think that that this could be the bottom line for my response. Um, first, I want to uh, respond to a question that Bill Galston asked this morning, which is how are we defining our outcome, our objective? Um, and and I, I want to make it very clear, at least for my comments, that um, I consider you know the measurements of poverty reduction or equality that these are measures of equity, and I prefer to use the term equity. Uh, which is, for me, economic well-being. So that is my objective, which is um, how, what is the effect of globalization on economic well-being? Not necessarily equality, not necessarily poverty reduction, although those are all parts of it, but I have a much broader, uh, much, much broader definition. With that, I'm going to step back about 30 years, and I want to start with um, a book that was actually written in 1975, many people in this room will remember it, by Art Oaken, and he wrote this essay called Equality and Efficiency. This was at a time when the United States was debating policy choices between unemployment and inflation, and he writes, the contrast among American families in living standards and in material wealth reflect the system of rewards and penalties that is intended to encourage efforts and channel it into socially productive activity. To the extent that the system succeeds, it generates an efficient economy. But the pursuit of efficiency necessarily creates inequalities. And hence, society faces a trade-off between efficiency and equality. He then goes on to write, the presence of a trade-off between efficiency and equality does not mean that everything that is good for one is necessarily bad for the other. Nonetheless, there are places where the two goals conflict and those pose problems. He concludes his essays, in both equality and efficiency, if both equality and efficiency are valued and neither takes absolute priority over the other, then in places where they conflict, compromise ought to be struck. And in such cases, some equality will be sacrificed for the sake of efficiency and some efficiency for the sake of equality. But any sacrifice of either has to be justified as a necessary means of obtaining more of the other. The second uh, site I'd like to make is from a comments that were made by Stan Fisher at the time he was the first deputy managing director at a conference in June, this was June 8th, 1988. The conference was entitled Economic Policy and Equity. And in response to a question he posed to himself, why do equity considerations matter to the IMF? 
He answered, quote, first, as a matter of social justice, all members of society should share in the benefits of economic growth. Second, there is also an instrumental argument for equity. Adjustment programs that are equitable and growth that is equitable are more likely to be sustainable. So first, I'd like to remind you that Art Oaken was writing this at a time, although we were following the oil shock, the first oil shock, and a significant recession, uh, this book did come 15 years after uh, annual growth of 4.4% uh, of real growth every year. And that at that time, believe it or not, although trade was a very small part of the US economy, the United States was running a current account surplus of 1% of GDP. Uh, Stan's book, a little bit more closer to our time, I would just remind you, or Stan's comments at this conference, were made, at least here in the United States, this was 1998, we had already experienced 29 consecutive quarters of real economic growth averaging 3.5%, and the economy would post another 10 quarters during which real economic growth would reach 4.4%. Nominal world GDP had doubled over the previous 15 years, and annual growth was 3.5%. As we remember, though, 16 months after Stan made these comments, in Seattle, during the, ministerial, during the ministerial meetings, there were riots in the streets, and I would dare to say that there has not been a World Bank IMF meeting since that doesn't remember those riots. So I would argue today we also gather at a very interesting time. This has been noted and has been characterized as no ordinary time. We are approaching the 70th anniversary of the Bretton Woods Conference, and despite incredible growth and expansion in wealth, technology, reduction in poverty, probably the most in human history, there is growing anxiety about economic well-being and globalization in many places around the world. Maybe not all, but in many. And it is increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to pursue further multilateral liberalization in trade and investment. Although there's a great debate over measurement, and I'm not going to get into that debate, we do know that the distribution of income, at least in most of the industrialized countries, has deteriorated in recent years. And here I would ask you to look at one of the handouts. It's titled Global Wage Report. The ILO has just put out these charts that show the relationship between developments in wages and developments in productivity. For me, this would be a, a really very good indicator of equity, how much productivity gains are being shared with people through wages. I'm not going to go through these tables. I'm just going to show you very quickly. If you look at figure 11, that's the developed countries, you would note that Japan and the United States are the outliers, also Germany, experiencing relatively high productivity gains and low wage gains. Figure 18, Thailand, India, Hong Kong, Sri Lanka, the Philippines. Again, here are lower productivity gains, but low and maybe even negative increases in wages or declines in wages. Uh, figure 22, very interesting. Latin America, we've got Nicaragua, Colombia, and Panama, two countries that we have just signed free trade agreements with where they've got very significant productivity gains, doesn't look like they're sharing them through wage increases. Um, figure 24 is the Middle East, and figure 27 um, is African countries. <clears throat> these are just examples, like, like I said, I'm not going into detail, but these are just examples for me in terms of a measure of sharing the efficiency gains with the, through equity. And as we know, the world has not yet fully recovered from the global financial crisis and the worst economic slowdown since the Great Depression. In the advanced economies, economic growth averaged 1.5% in real terms over the last two years, and the prospects is little more than 2% over the next five years. Um, and in the United States, I don't need to go into detail, except let me just say, because I think this tends to get forgotten in the day-to-day the -day numbers that we are following, Although we celebrate the fact, celebrate the fact that the, that the uh, employment in this country increased by 150,000 in the previous month, and this is a great achievement, if it were to continue at 150,000 each month, 
uh, which again is above the average over the last 30 years, it is still going to take two and a half years to get us back to the employment level that we had prior to the recession. And the this was mentioned actually earlier today, the employment population ratio is currently six percentage points below what it was back in 2000. Another thing is that it's been 20 years since the last successful multilateral trade negotiations were completed. And I would argue that trade policy has been balkanized by the proliferation of bilateral and regional agreements, which have may actually may have, have, have uh, signified the end of any future large-scale multilateral agreements. As my colleague Arvid Sumaranmin has, been, has, has very clearly set, uh, pointed out, there's been a shift in the balance of economic power. And I think that is reflecting the challenges that the United States and Europe are having in setting the international economic policy making agenda. So we really are coming to the end of the Bretton Woods era. Uh, but what I would argue is that what most of the people at this IMF conference in 1988 missed and ignored was the importance of what previous two speakers have talked about, the importance of economic, political, and social institutions in sharing the benefits from economic liberalization and growth with workers and their families and society in general. Um, in fact, some of the speakers at this conference actually railed against these institutions. Um, I believe that these political, economic, and social institutions play a critical role in determining the effect and the effectiveness of economic policies. Now, let me just be specific. These institutions span everything from the form of government that a nation might have, the degree to which people have a voice in that government, the nation's education system, the independence of its central bank and how its monetary policy is implemented, the progressivity of its tax system, and yes, the existence and enforcement of minimum wage policies, uh, other labor standards, as well as labor market policies such as an unemployment insurance system. I believe that these institutions, these economic, political, and social institutions are the glue that keep societies together and what forms the social contract that is believed to be the foundation of democratic societies. And herein lies the problem. The people who met at Bretton Woods almost 70 years ago came together to address a collective action problem, that there were very large barriers to the exchange of goods, services, and capital. Their actions and the organizations that they set up to deal with that problem slowly morphed into what we now call an international economic system. But this system does not have any of these economic, political, and social institutions at the international level to bind the system together. Instead, uh, oh, and, and, and as I said before, the IMF and the WTO sometimes actually argue against the need for these institutions or have played no constructive role, a constructive role in incorporating them into the system or have fought them being incorporated into the system. And so, as someone mentioned earlier today, we got the Washington Consensus calling for, for fiscal discipline, liberalization of trade and finance, and reorientation of public expenditures and tax policy, all aimed at promoting further economic efficiency at any expense, and virtually no calls for economic, political, and social institutions to address equity. In my mind, this, this amounts to international trickle-down policies. Instead of taking the lead in addressing these equity concerns, following Stan Fisher's own admonition that if not doing so may make the system unsustainable, the multilateral organizations instead, this includes the IMF and the World WTO, and we've actually was mentioned earlier today, have taken a hands-off strategy in most cases, hiding behind what they call subsidiarity or national sovereignty. And now let me take just one simple example. The other handout that I gave you uh, and this is really not meant to overstate it, but just as an example, unemployment insurance programs around the world. Uh, we have one in the United States. They are, we had them in most industrialized countries. We think the whole world has them. Well, in fact, only 78 out of 186 countries in the, in the, in the world have unemployment insurance systems. And if you look at the, at the, at the graph, at the table that I've given you, the distribution is quite, is quite uh, troubling because it is the industrialized countries that have these infrastructures in place, but as we go down the income groups, less and less of them have, um, have unemployment insurance programs. In fact, 
five of the 19 countries in the G20 do not have unemployment insurance systems, including India, Indonesia, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey. In the United States, the president has had, presidents, not just the current one, but others, have had to ask Congress to establish emergency unemployment insurance programs during each of the last eight recessions, dating back to the 1950s. So much for what we call automatic stabilizer. And just last week, again, at the pressure, at the, re at the request of President Obama, and I, I, I clearly, I strongly endorse that, we had to renew these emergency procedures again for the ninth time in this current period. How many times do you have to renew something that's an emergency in order to find out that there may be structural problems with the program itself? So let me conclude. I would argue that the United States, Europe, and China should take the lead in getting all countries, big and small, advanced and emerging, to commit to a timetable for adopting and reforming positive adjustment measures aimed at ensuring that the efficiency gains derived from economic liberalization are better shared with all these society. These measures might include, but not limited to, uh, minimum wage programs in countries of, and other policies that ensure that wages increase, increases are more linked to productivity gains. I would just note parenthetically that the United States is, is guilty in, in this regard also. Uh, unemployment insurance systems, active la labor market programs to enhance labor market flexibility, adoption of the core ILO labor standards. The ILO, OECD, and the World Bank could provide technical assistance in this endeavor. The IMF should provide some initial financing when and if necessary. All international and regional financial institutions should make a commitment to have a timetable for adoption of these measures part of their negotiations, and furthermore, uh, developing a timetable for design and implementation of these programs should or might be a prerequisite for any future lending. Ironically, I might call on the WTO to actually provide the institutional infrastructure for negotiations on this, what I would call an international agreement on positive adjustment measures. Um, I, I want to make it clear that there are, there are efforts to do this in some countries, but much of it is voluntary and advisory. And what I'm suggesting in response to Andy and Downey's comments is that we no longer have the luxury of just letting it remain like that, that we need to start putting some commitments and timetables in place. And uh, since countries have not been able to do it on their own, I think that that commitment must be enforced at the multilateral level, just as we call on countries to commit to trade liberalization. And so let me finally say that membership in the international economic system has its privileges, but it also has its responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Michael Froman, you just heard uh, the panelists uh, speak about their ideal uh, aspirations for the economic system to achieve greater democratic accountability, greater economic uh, justice. You've been on the front lines in this administration at the White House. You were also on the front lines in the 1990s when these institutions uh, really were taking a beating in, public, in the public perception. So you've had the responsibility not only of guiding them toward these ideals, but also stabilizing and keeping them going and keeping the world economy going. So how practical, tell us how to marry <laughs> some of these ideals with the practical realities that you confront every day. And so take a few minutes more than the others if you like. It sounds like I should get back to work. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Steve, for having me. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at Adam's first uh, conference as president, uh, like many of you. I really wanted to be here for this conference in part to ensure that Fred had actually retired. And so <laughs> I don't see him here, so I guess that, that has been, uh, that's been achieved. I'm supposed to provide the practitioner's perspective, which I, I gather means I'm not a, quite as smart as these other guys. And so I'll just try and uh, supplement what they've said. Uh, let, me, let me start by saying that I believe that there is uh, no inherent reason why global governance should be irretrievably at odds with local accountability. I think both must be pursued uh, uh, together, and I think pursued correctly, they can be mutually uh, reinforcing. And let me start with trade policy. Uh, because trade policy has such broad uh, 
ramifications, not just macroeconomic, but regulatory and distributive, it has to be grounded in local accountability. It cannot be just the product of a few corporate interests, but must represent the outcomes of a process that reflects broadly shared values and a diverse set of interests. And as Howard and, and Donnie said in their, in their remarks, the only way we're going to be able to build and support, uh, build and, and maintain a consensus of support for trade policy is if we recognize the distributional consequences of trade and take actions to ensure that the benefits of trade liberalization are broadly shared. So I share their perspective on that very much. Now, traditionally, here in the U.S., we've maintained that support for trade through a process of consultation between the executive and Congress that is more robust and more extensive than virtually any other area of policy. Our negotiating positions are shared in virtually real time with members of Congress and with their staff. Members of Congress have access to all of our draft negotiating texts and cleared staff on the relevant committees do as well, as well as dozens of cleared advisors representing a diverse set of business, labor, and NGO interests. And at the end of the day, any agreement we negotiate ultimately only goes into effect if it passes with a majority of votes in both houses of Congress. Although, as Donnie said, the fact that a democracy has approved it doesn't necessarily um, ensure that it is enhancing democratic accountability. Let me also say that, and I'll come back to that in a minute, let me also say that we're not alone in this regard, and, and you know, much has been written about the democracy deficit, uh, particularly uh, in Europe. But my understanding, and we have some EU colleagues and, and one of the renowned experts on the EU here on the panel, my understanding is that in any week in Brussels, there are 200 meetings between representatives of the member states and, me and members of the commission reviewing every commission proposed action at every stage uh, in its drafting. And when you add that to the ministerial meetings of each semester and to the now quite frequent head of state council meetings, increasingly frequent uh, head of state council meetings, it's hard to say that the process of coming up with decisions in the European Union, not to mention the role of the European Parliament, doesn't reflect a strong degree of accountability. And I just say from personal, from personal perspective and personal experience, when President Obama convened the leaders of the Eurozone and leaders of the European Union in Los Cabos at Camp David to talk about the Eurozone crisis, certainly there was a great appreciation in the room of the domestic, local, political constraints and drivers of policies, even at that pinnacle of global governance. So my sense is, is that while it's no guarantee that a democratically elected government, whatever they do, make sure that that's a democratic process, the linkage between how leaders see their democratic politics and their local accountability constraints and how that plays into local governance uh, is really quite strong. Let me go back to trade, though, for a moment, because notwithstanding already a very robust process for consultation, uh, this administration and this president decided that we wanted to make it even more deliberative and more democratic. And I think this goes to Donnie's point about the quality of democratic governance. And so we worked to ensure that the various trade advisory committees weren't just groups of lobbyists, but represented a broad array of interests from business to labor to nonprofit and, and NGOs as well. We sought to increase stakeholder involvement in all of the negotiations from Colombia to Panama, uh, Korea, and of course with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And let me say a word about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, because here we've pursued an unprecedented degree of involvement of stakeholders. Despite, in addition to the outreach that the USTR has done, as they always do with businesses and farmers and ranchers and workers uh, across the country, uh, we've had nearly 150 meetings with our trade advisory committees. We've posted 110 documents for review by our cleared advisors. And more than that, we have actually structured an opportunity for the stakeholder community to come to the negotiations, to be present at the now 15 rounds of negotiations and provide direct feedback, not just to us, but to the negotiators of all the other countries as well. So when we gathered in Leesburg, Virginia last year, we had 255 stakeholder groups present meeting in sort of a sort of a college uh, 
fair type environment uh, with all of the negotiators from all of the countries involved in TPP. And, and, and so I think in, in, in this will be seen in retrospect as the most transparent and participatory trade negotiation uh, in history. But the commitment to ensuring that global governance is supportive of local accountability isn't just a process commitment. I think it goes to the substance. And here are a number of things that Donnie said about democracy enhancing globalization or universalizable norms of global governance, I think are really very much at the forefront of what we're trying to do in TPP. Uh, take, for example, regulation. This is an audience that knows well that trade liberalization is not just about tariffs, it's about the non-tariff barriers and more and more about regulatory barriers. We're fully committed to ensuring that countries can pursue bona fide regulation in the interest of the health and safety of their people. But we're equally determined to ensure that those regulations aren't used as a disguised barrier for trade. And that's why coherence around regulations and regulatory process, good regulatory process, has been so central to everything we've done from, from APEC in Honolulu to the TPP negotiations to the conversations that we're currently having with the European Union. We're pursuing an agenda that calls for transparent, accountable, and rules-based regulatory processes. This isn't intended to dictate the outcomes of those processes. It's not an effort to say that every country has to adopt U.S. regulations. But it is an effort to say that countries should be transparent about what they intend to do about regulation and offer an opportunity for the public and stakeholders to provide input into the regulatory process and apply some widely held recognized rules, science, in the formulation of the regulations. And I think this goes to what Donnie said about if we can be focusing our global governance efforts on improving the quality of local governance, of democratic participation, all the more important. And that true is also true of what uh, Andy said about the, the role of factions. Because it's, it's a mistake to think of sovereignty and local accountability as the same thing. Uh, we know in our own system, we know in other systems, that the role of special interests, and I, I heard a little bit of the last panel, but seem to be a strong stand against special interests, that uh, when special interests can play a role in the legislative or regulatory process, securing rents for themselves at the expense of less well-organized forces in society, then that's not democratic local accountability. And to the degree that through negotiations like TPP, we can reach uh, agreement on disciplines around transparent, participatory, rules-based regulatory processes, it can actually counteract the impact of special interests and create greater true local accountability. Now, let me mention two other examples of that. Uh, one that struck me this morning when a former trade minister came to visit and talked about how the G20 transparency exercise, the G20 requiring or calling on its, its members to be transparent about the trade restricting measures that they adopted played a very important role in that minister's country in terms of disciplining the role that special interests could play in seeking protectionist measures. Not that it, it achieved 100% of its objectives, but it at least imposed a cost on countries allowing special interests to hijack the regulatory or the legislative process for protectionist purposes. And given the crisis that we've gone through, I believe achieved a remarkably low level of protectionism, um, all things considered. The third example this I'd give is something that we launched uh, th two years ago called the Open Government Partnership, which now has 47 members and another 11 countries that want to join. And here too, this is a, a multilateral, or excuse me, a plurilateral effort global governance designed specifically to enhance local accountability, transparency, and democratic participation by requiring the countries that participate, and it's all voluntary, to come up with plans, action plans, for making their systems more transparent, for publishing their budgets, for providing real opportunity for democratic participation in decision making, and the fact that more countries are demanding to come in as a, as a stamp of good approval by the international community shows the power that some of these uh, global governance mechanisms can have on enhancing local accountability. Uh, let me say a word about the role that these sorts of plurilateral efforts play, because uh, 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 Howard mentioned the balkanization of the international trading system, um, and certainly multilateral 
trade liberalization we all recognize uh, would be the best outcome if we could possibly achieve it. But here I think, and maybe this is the practitioner speaking, um, here I think we ought to be quite comfortable with the 80-20 rule. When the G20 represents 80% of global GDP and 80% of the global population, or the major economies forum represents 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions, it strikes me that those organizations taking action in their respective areas are striking an appropriate balance between legitimacy and effectiveness, provided there's an adequate degree of diversity and representativeness within their membership, as there are in those organizations. Now, I think it's much easier for the G20 to take action in areas where the G20 themselves are the major shareholders of institutions, like the international financial institutions, where their decision to act can be translated through shareholding into decisions by the international financial institutions. It's less easy for them to take action in trade or in climate change, where the relevant organizations, whether it's the WTO or the UNFCCC, are one country, one vote sorts of institutions. But perhaps that's the point, which is that there are roles for global governance through plurilateral forums that are less than fully representative, whether it's the G8, APEC, the G20, or the MEF, they, provided that they operate in their greatest areas of legitimacy. And that's what we're seeing in the trade front, whether it's APEC that started off with the information technology agreement and now has taken steps to reduce tariffs on environmental goods and services, or what we're seeing in services, where the group of what we call very good friends in Geneva are developing a plurilateral platform for liberalization of services with the hopes that more countries join over time. That's what TPP is all about, creating a high standard agreement that could potentially serve as a platform that other countries can join and that can introduce into the bloodstream of the multilateral trading system new disciplines, including around transparency and accountability. That's what the OGP is about. And yet, there are still areas where multilateralism uh, is alive and well and, and necessary. And I would just point out one, uh, and that's the area of trade facilitation. You know, we've, we've successfully turned the page on Doha, not ended the mandate, not killed Doha, but simply reached agreement multilateral to pursue fresh and innovative approaches to address its objectives. And one of the most promising areas is the area of trade facilitation, which is a win-win for the entire world. It's hard to see what the legitimate public purpose is in maintaining red tape or in different customs organizations. And yet, and, and by the way, and it's the least developed countries that pay the biggest costs of these obstacles at the border. You know, by some, by some measure, I can't remember whether it's a Peterson study or otherwise, it's a 5% of GDP is lost in Africa in terms of revenue because of red tape and corruption uh, at the border. Last year at the G20, it was Benin representing the African Union and Cambodia representing ASEAN who argued most strenuously that trade facilitation was in the interest of the LDCs. But right now in Geneva, you've got middle-income countries, and particularly India, who are, in fact, standing in the way of a multilateral agreement because they believe it's something that the developed countries want it would benefit from, and therefore they should get paid for it. This is going to be a real test of the multilateral system, in my view, because if we can't reach agreement on something that everybody recognizes as a win-win for the entire global economy, it's a little hard to see what we can reach multilateral agreement on. So let me conclude um, with just three points. One is that I believe global governments can be pursued in a manner consistent with local accountability. Two, that local accountability can actually be strengthened through in initiatives, through global governance. And three, that with the goal of increasing local accountability, we should continue to explore all methods for strengthening global governance, plurilateral and multilateral, recognizing that on one hand, plurilateral forums are more legitimate in some areas than in others. And on the other hand, if multilateral forums become deadlocked over even the lowest common denominator agreements, further attention should be paid to maximizing the chances that pluralateralism can provide a positive contagion uh, for the multilateral system. Mike, I want to quickly come back to uh, your point with a question, and then Andy, before he has to go, maybe you can respond too. There certainly is, despite the um, hopeful outlook you have for expanding uh, trade and other aspects of globalization, there's a sense that's run through the last four 
three or four years that it's kind of tapped out, that we're, that we're stalled. Uh, because of public perception about all the ethical and accountability issues that we've been talking about all day. Do you, from inside the administration, do you see it that way or do you see it other as, as just um, a collection of special interests in, in the middle, in the emerging markets is, is stalling this? Or do you see a real problem about the legitimacy and fairness of the system as a perception problem? And uh, when you answer, Andy, because you have to go, maybe you could respond too. I would, I would not term it as stalled. I, I think what has happened is that much of the low-hanging fruit has been harvested over successive multilateral rounds. And we're now getting, two things are happening. One is we're getting to the more difficult issues like non-tariff barriers, regulatory divergences, and how to ensure that the benefits of liberalization are broadly shared. On the other hand, you have the emergence of countries like China, India, and Brazil, who would like to maintain the status of developing countries and put less on the table in terms of liberalization, and yet, in many respects, are fully globally competitive with the developed countries, with the industrialized countries, and therefore, industrialized countries, at least like ourselves, are not willing to unilaterally open up a market without some degree of of uh, reciprocity on the other side. So I think those two issues make it hard, uh, have, have made it hard to achieve multilateral liberalization. At the same time, you've seen a thousand flowers bloom, regionally, bilaterally, plurilaterally. Uh, and those may be the most uh, ripe areas for progress right now, as, and as someone said, provided that they feed into and help support the multilateral trading system over time. Um, I think there may be opportunities, but I do think that the history um, weighs on us. I agree with Donnie that, that TRIPS is a good example of um, something that um, does not pass the prima facie taste, test of being democratically legitimate, not, not because it was a redistributive transfer. I think all trade agreements are redistributive transfers. You can't distinguish the good ones from the bad ones that way. Um, but because, as was mentioned earlier today, it was uh, by somebody who was at the, the WTO at the time, um, uh, uh, it, it was negotiated in such a way um, that the uh, parties in the developing world were ignorant of its effects, taken advantage of, and couldn't be reversed. It might even be, from some points of view, a violation of human rights. Um, so that, I mean, in the, in the medical area, so that, so that left a bad taste in people's mouth. And then I think when, when we understand how trade negotiations in practice work, I mean, you can understand the Indian point of view. Um, uh, it, it's an economist who says the Indians should be in favor of this because they gain 5% of their GDP because that's the consumer benefit to India. And lots of economic studies will tell them it's true. But the way that the GATT and the WTO traditionally worked were by trading off benefits to exporters, not by trading off gains to consumers. Um, and that's the politics that makes it work. And so the Indians are actually quite right on the politics to say if there's a great gain to Indian consumers, it means from a political point of view there's a great gain to somebody's exporters and we want to be paid for that. And I think only if it works in the political sense can you expect that, that there'll be progress in the future. Danny, um, I want to ask you about your comment uh, that uh, we need to enhance domestic policy space for uh, countries in the global uh, financial and trading system. Does that mean that we should pause now before we uh, expand that system? I mean, are we at this stalling point uh, or, uh, I mean, how would you characterize it? I think there are many areas where the, um, that that um, you know that most of the gains have been eked out of, and I think the the and and the um, Doha round was an excellent example of having spent uh, undue amounts of time and political capital um, on an, uh, on a set of negotiations where the the returns at the margin were really quite meager, um, and and that's an example of where a lot of um, uh, time and political capital was wasted. 
um, uh, now I would say that, uh, that that's not true of all areas in the international economy. The question of, of uh, temporary labor mobility has come up before. Um, uh, you know, if you ask any economist where are the, the, the greatest unexploited gains uh, of globalization today, um, they clearly would be in, uh, in the expansion of uh, temporary mobili mobility, labor mobility schemes. Um, that's where the big gains are. Uh, now, of course, you know, that's, uh, that's also, it's, it's going to be not necessarily immigration, temporary uh, labor mobility uh, um, in a generalized form um, and, and uh, in a way that, uh, that, that expands both low skill and high skill um, uh, uh, worker um, mobility. Now, I mean, I view the, the, uh, the, the labor, global labor regime today somewhat uh, similar to where the trade regime was in the, in the late 40s and early 50s, where uh, basically the system had all closed up um, and, and the gains to be had relative to redistribution was actually quite large. Um, and, and the issue with trade is, is we know that, that as, the, as, the, as the barriers get small, uh, the ratio of redistribution to efficient gains uh, 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 you know, enlarges. Um, so it's where the barriers are the largest, such as uh, in, in, in the labor area, where in fact uh, the distributional, uh, the amount of distribution relative to the efficiency gains is, is, is relatively small. Uh, so that's not to, um, to, to minimize, obviously, the kind of distributional conflict that, that, uh, that, that labor mobility creates as well. Um, but, uh, but there is one thing, actually, in, in, uh, in, 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 in benefit of, of labor mobility as opposed to outsourcing, which is that when you're expanding international uh, commerce through bringing labor in, at least you're providing labor rights for the workers that you're bringing in because they're coming in and operating under the same kind of labor regimes uh, as at home. Whereas when you're outsourcing, uh, in other words, taking advantage of cheap labor through outsourcing as opposed to bringing them in, uh, you're actually uh, potentially running into the kinds of problems that we talked about in the previous panel, which is that in sort of in, in long supply chains that, that you know, these workers uh, might end up being, uh, being employed in highly unsafe, um, uh, uh, hazardous, and, 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 and uh, kinds of, of jobs with their rights aren't protected. So I would say that that's an area where, in fact, we haven't gone far. In fact, it's a, it's a question of, of, of setting the agenda. Uh, in the WTO, I would, much more, I would much rather see a discussion about the rules uh, of uh, dispute settlement and, and uh, rather than this sort of, you know, eking out the last sort of efficiency gains on, on industrial tariffs. Um, I think in financial globalization, I think we are going to be seeing a certain amount of deglobalization. I think the name of the game there is going to be sort of managing that process, and we're only at the beginning of that. Um, so that's sort of where I think we are. Howard, Howard, do you want to make a quick comment on that? And then I want to ask just, Mike Roman. Just a, 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 a very quick comment. This is um, in no way uh, was this any way a statement from the Obama administration, but for the some of us who were viewing from the outside, it appeared during the last four years that the strategy was that we really want to focus on strengthening up the House internal domestic economy before we go off into any big ambitious international agenda. And so health care and uh, you know, all of these kinds of things, even there was unemployment insurance reform and things like that. Um, and I think the administration was successful in getting many of those things and has strengthened its domestic house and so that it's able to prepare. Um, is that something that, uh, is that something that, that might, that, that an agenda that we might have for the, for the rest of the world? To say, instead of putting, you know, instead of forcing more negotiations on countries that may not be willing to do it, say we're gonna, our agenda is gonna be to help everyone get up to a certain level of having a domestic, you know, having a, a nice, strong domestic infrastructure at home, kind of do what the, if I'm correct in saying what the administration seemed to have done, to kind of broaden that out internationally. Mike Froman, why don't you tell us how realistic it is to expand the agenda for globalization in the way Howard just said, or to uh, have a major expansion of domestic 
labor, or, I'm sorry, of labor mo mobility across borders, which um, is going to be addressed by the administration in coming months uh, as an immigration issue, but there are other aspects of that. Uh, how realistic are those uh, possibilities? Well, uh, without wanting to preempt or, or, or preview anything, let me, let me let, let, yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, let me, let me, but let, but let me, let me share a few thoughts. One is, we, starting with the Pittsburgh summit, the G20, we pressed the G20 to uh, reach an agreement to phase out inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. It's good economics. It's good climate policy. It's good health policy. It's good all around policy. I'd say we made modest progress. Um, not, not huge progress. Right now, or I think the latest figures were about $600 billion were spent in inefficient fossil fuel subsidies uh, in, I think, 2011, if, I, if I'm correct, 91% of which did not go to the poorest. So to the degree that these fossil fuel subsidies are justified as needing to make sure that the poor have access to affordable energy, 91% of it's being wasted. We're trying to reformulate that argument a bit to say, because what's clearly, you know, it's obvious is that how difficult it is politically to do fossil fuel reform, to say what we really need is to ensure that countries have in place decent social safety nets that would give them the political space to be able to reduce fossil fuel subsidies, reduce food subsidies, other wasteful subsidies, targeted social safety nets that really got at the most vulnerable in society. and. If there were an international economic institute that wanted to do some work on that, uh, that would be that would be very much uh, uh, that would be very much welcome, um, uh, and that's the kind of thing. I mean, I'm not sure that it's fully responsive, Howard, to your to your suggestion, but it does go to the issue of yeah, we're we're talking about it with the GA, we're talking about the G20, we're talking about a number a number of different forums, and of course, this isn't something we have a we certainly don't have a uh, as you pointed out a, a monopoly on wisdom here. Um, you know, Mexico, Brazil, conditional cash transfer programs. There's a lot of very good experience out there. The World Bank has a lot of very good experience out there. And if we could, as we're looking at countries like Egypt and Jordan, who are, you know, in serious financial straits, in part because of the share of their budget that goes to inefficient fossil fuel subsidies, it would be nice to be able to provide them with an alternative. Uh, I kept my promise to Adam to start on time, and that uh, means that we're going to end on time, which will be in about five minutes. So there are a few questions from the floor. What I'd like to do is ask you first, keep them very succinct, make sure that there are questions, not statements, and let's take two or three at the outset and have them be, be answered. <laughs> yes, Stelios first. Yes, this is for Professor Roderick. You spoke about um, uh, issues of immigration, and you mentioned that certain failures have to do with uh, failures in domestic governance rather than international. But if you look what is happening in Europe today, in particular in Greece, you can clearly see that the failure to address the immigration issue there, it's a failure at a European Union level. And it's, um, it's a problem where the... Um, national and domestic policies are actually preventing a solution at the EU level. Thank you. A question to Howard Rosen. What do you understand by economic well-being? You said a measure for I think, progress or something like that would be economic well-being. So what do you understand by economic in this context? Uh, Wade Jacoby at uh, BYU and Center for Transatlantic Relations. So um, a couple of questions about Europe very quickly. Andy, your constitutional take on what's going on in Europe, when I hear constitutionalism, I think of fairly long, slow, deliberative processes. Now we're rushing full speed toward fiscal union and a bunch of other things. What's your take on? how you do high-speed constitutionalism. And for Danny Roderick, um, it's more a question about banking union. I, if I take your point about the gradual deglobalization, a managed pr process perhaps of, of financial, I would say financial localism of some kind, 
Uh, what is your take on, again, this rush towards banking union where the presumption, I mean, just to go back to Chuck Sable's point, do we really know what is the one best system? And if we do, is it wise to get there as quickly as we are planning to get there? Thank you, Danny. Why don't you answer the first and third question and as efficiently as you can? Oh, no, no, it's all right. No, I can, okay. you can wait. Yeah, I, I'm glad the issue of, of EU came up in, in connection with the things that I said because um, e, the EU and, and particularly the Eurozone in principle is the exception to my argument, which is to say that um, if you are not, um, it, 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 you can imagine um, expanding uh, economic integration uh, with a simultaneous transnationalization of the political community um, so that you avoid these kinds of tensions. So that I, I, you know, ultimately, I, and ideally, we could have imagined the Eurozone uh, where uh, um, each individual country becomes uh, a member of a single economic market, uh, but their politics have also become federalized uh, at the level of the Union. And, and one interpretation of what was happening in Europe and the Eurozone until uh, a crisis not of its doing hit it, was that this, it was on a slow uh, progress towards that ultimate goal. And, and, the, and the misfortune of the Eurozone was that it got caught midway in this, uh, in this um, highly difficult integration process, both economic and political, um, where the political institutions were highly incomplete um, to begin with. Um, so I think the, the choice that the Eurozone faces is, you know, either it goes towards a much more complete political union, uh, in, in which in case it does make sense to think of a common banking system, common financial regulations, and a significant mutualization of, uh, of, of, of debts and, and, and so forth. Um, or if that's not going to work out is that, that you know, if, if more political union isn't going to happen, uh, ultimately you'll have end up with less economic union too. So either more political union to sustain a true single market or less economic union to face up to the reality that you're not getting the political integration that's required. So I think the, 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 the difficulty that Greece is facing today is precisely that it's an example of what happens when countries give up the policy, give up and narrow the policy space without a compensating increase in the democratic uh, rights uh, that go beyond the national borders. So that's really where the imbalance and the democratic deficit of the union, uh, I think, arose. And that's, I think, the reflection of the crisis. Andy, and then Howard. Um, so yeah, it's a great place to 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 end high-speed constitutionalism. Um, but I'm going to disagree with Danny just because we haven't disagreed on much so far. Um, uh, I don't think that a lot of people think the problem is um, either the euro collapses or you have to be able to move toward some kind of centralized European level solution. I think that was the sort of strength of the question. I don't agree. I don't think there is a centralized European solution on offer. Um, why? Because I don't think you could transfer enough money to keep Italy and Spain solvent. That's not really the issue. The issue is convergence or collapse. In fact, I don't think Danny's being Rodrickian enough. The real issue is, are these economies uh, convergent enough? Can they be made similar enough? to live in the same arrangement. Then you can deal with centralizing to the extent possible among these more convergent economies. The bet that was made originally in the Eurozone when they created it was that these economies would converge. Then they didn't converge. Now they're stuck with the, the consequences uh, of it. Um, and it is very, very difficult to get the policies in question to converge. The EU has actually done a pretty good job, I mean, given that they started from not very much, um, in, in working on convergence of things like budgetary oversight and even banking regulation, I mean, and, and, and IMF-style oversight of crisis. I mean, given that they didn't have a lot to work with legally, it's, it's pretty impressive. But if you think about a country like Italy, where the problem is it's the second largest exporter in Europe. It's going in a completely different direction competitive-wise uh, from Germany, and you need to fix that. 
what are we talking about policy-wise? We're talking about corporate governance. We're talking about wage setting. We're talking about unions. We're talking about education. We're talking about the relationship between the tradable and non-tradable sector. All that needs to be fixed. That cannot be fixed by a common regulation in Brussels. It's too diverse. It's too different from other people. It needs to be fixed in Rome. Um, and so the big question is, will that happen or will it not happen? And that's the limitation on the Mike Foreman solution, right? That works well if you're dealing with something discrete like oil subsidies, um, where there is a, a very focused issue and you can look for the best practice. That's the, the Chuck Sable issue where people are thinking about the same thing. But when you're dealing about a lot of different economies and macroeconomics where everything is engaged, then I think it is very difficult to have even a sensible process where people learn from each other because Italy is so different from Denmark, which is so different from Portugal. And in that case, I, it's what makes me rather pessimistic about the long-term prospects for the euro. Howard, I'm sure it's impossible to answer Ulrich's question in 60 seconds yeah. or less, but you're going to have to no, do I it. It's, I can be very brief. I don't have any specific thing in mind. It, it includes poverty reduction. It includes, you know, but the, uh, so it's a lot of different indicators. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm emphasizing that it's economic as opposed to people saying, you know, we have better technology now and this and that. So I'm just, I'm just trying to say on basic on, on economic measures. And I like this one of looking at the relationship between productivity and wages. I think that that's pretty good for my all of those things are part of it okay. employment unemployment wages I mean all those things all right. well I uh, am grateful to all of you for staying some of you all day thank you very much the last word of uh, benediction goes to uh, Adam Posen but Adam thank you for uh, uh, convening us uh, for uh, for this most interesting and unusual day no, no, thank you all. Uh, those of you who stuck with us all day, those of you who've been in and out, uh, obviously a huge debt to Stephen Howard, who shepherded this project and got many of the great people here. A huge debt to particularly a senior official like Mike and Congressman Frank, who made time to give us the reality check and engage. Um, a huge thank you to the Niarcos Foundation, because as I've said twice today, and this is the last time, they gave us the freedom and the space and the encouragement to allow us to do this, and that's how we do our best work with a committed guiding partner like that, and we're very proud of that. Thank you to the New Republic for, we hope, bearing the fruits of this wisdom forward for us in the coming days and weeks. Uh, we're looking forward to that partnership, but I also know that many of the people, including some distinguished friends on the panel, have their own blogs. So feel free to promote the wonderful things we did and talked about today, each in your own way, as much as possible. Most of all, thank you to all our speakers, many of whom did travel, go to some sacrifice to be here, and really put themselves out in a very frank and forthright way. I'm not going to give you much of a benediction, but dearly globalized, let, let us let us come together. Let us be the big tent church of globalization, as it were. We have a world that is proceeding down that path. We have a role for this institution and all the stakeholders in it to engage and think about the ways to keep that path forward, not blindly, not heedlessly of consequences, but in the practical sense. And I think today was a beautiful example of that be it Chuck Sable's remarks, or George David's, or Mike Froman's, or Danny's now, that we were talking about not the sort of global big picture, is globalization a good thing, but how in a given issue area for a given country in a given trade negotiation, with some ethical concern in mind, you make things progress, you make it better for all those involved. I'm happy to take Mike and others' research suggestions. We'll be doing our part on that, and so with that, this session is closed. Amen. Um,